Hi, everyone. I'm Tina Srebotniak. I'm the acting head of programming here at the uh, library in the Appel Salon. Very happy to have you here at the Bram and Bluma Appel Salon for this evening with Micah White, who, of course, I've been calling Mika for the last three months, but I now know it's Micah, Micah White, in conversation with Now Magazine's Susan Cole. So let me introduce our host for tonight, who's going to be doing the interviewing and asking those tough questions. She is the senior entertainment and books editor at Now Magazine, Susan Cole. Thank you all. And thank you very much, Tina. And thank you all for coming this evening to this very special event. But first of all, thanks to the library for inviting Now Magazine to participate now, as I hope you know, is the News and Entertainment Weekly here in the city. You can read everything we do in print or online at nowtoronto.com. And there's a really great Q&A with Micah White that our ecoholic, Adria Vassal, did with him. So I urge you to have a look at that um, when you have a chance. I'm imagining that most of you are here um, for a particular reason, because you, like me, have a very strong sense that this world needs some profound transformation. You crave it, you need it, you feel it in your bones, you feel it intellectually, but you're not entirely sure how to bring it about. Uh, and that's exactly what our guest is interested in this evening. He is an editor at Adbusters, which, as you may know, is a magazine that critiques and tries to do something about the extent to which corporations are co-opting our consciousness. And he's also a founder of the Occupy movement, which I'm sure, co-founder, which I'm sure you know, captured the imagination and the passion of activists around the world in 2011. He is an independent thinker, one of the reasons why I really, really like what he does. He comes here this evening with this beautiful thing, The End of Protest, a new playbook for revolution. He takes intellectual risks, and I really can't wait to have the conversation. Please welcome Micah White. So we only have 45 minutes to figure out how we're going to change the world, so let's get started. Um, a reminder to you, as you heard, uh, we will be opening up the, uh, the floor to questions after we're done here. So think about your questions, because as I've said every time I do something like this, I really like it when the audience does my job for me. So um, I'm really looking forward to engaging you as well in the conversation, and I know Micah is too. So. Let's start by the fact that you challenge us right from the beginning with the title. Yeah. Because most of us have the sense that we're supposed to be getting our voices heard. And yet here you are almost advocating, almost advocating the end of protest or describing it. Tell us a bit about why you called this book the end of protest and, 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 and to what extent does that phrase frame our conversation? Yeah, I think that's the perfect place to start. Thank you. Yeah. So what I mean by the end of protest isn't that there's an absence of protest, but instead, on the contrary, that we have a proliferation of ineffective protest, that we have more protests in human history that are larger than they've ever been in human history, and yet these protests don't seem to be creating the social change that we desire. So for me, the end of protest is it's, it's part of the cycle of, so, of social change. It's that, it's that time in, during the cycle of social change when the tactics stop working, the activists don't know what to do, and it requires a kind of innovation and renewal to break out of that, that period. But I think that you can't, you can't realize that you're in the end of protest until you start, you can't break out of the end of protest until you acknowledge that you are in the time of the end of protest. Well, you were involved in the Occupy movement, and we had uh, our own contingent taking over the St. James uh, Park out uh, downtown. Um, there would be some people who would say that actually there were many things that Occupy did accomplish, and yet you've referred to it consistently as a constructive failure. So talk a little bit about the extent to which you think 
occupied failed. Right. Okay. So there's a there's a common narrative I think within activism, which is that you know nothing's ever a failure, nothing's ever a defeat, especially in reference to Occupy Wall Street. You know, very very frequently we'll hear people say that, well, you guys changed the discourse. Look at look at the national elections that are happening right now. Bernie Sanders is using this language. Even Hillary is using this language. Um, those are it's true. And we and other things that we did, we trained a new generation of activists. We launched. We made activism cool again. Okay. Fine. But those are symptoms of the, f of the fact that we created a global movement that spread to 82 countries. Those weren't the objective. Those are merely just byproducts of the, the fact of what, we achieve, of what we created, this large global social movement. So I call it a constructive failure, which is not the same as a total failure. <laughs> a total failure would mean that we did nothing good. Of, co of course, we had many good things. You know, it's, I'm glad that Occupy happened. We should all be glad that Occupy happened. But it's a constructive failure because it taught us about the limitations of our current notions of activism. I think it's very important to realize that with Occupy Wall Street, we basically achieved the, the paradigm, the storyline of what the ideal social movement should be. We had it for about 60 days. It was global, largely nonviolent, had pretty much a unified message. It's cut across demographics, but didn't achieve what we set out to, what we set out to achieve. But what's interesting, Micah, is that I've done this little test with a number of activist friends of mine to ask them, what did you think was the primary um, impulse, the first impulse for the Occupy movement? And I'm not going to test my audience here tonight, but um, most people say, oh, it was to talk about the income gap. <laughs> and oh, it was to talk about how the, uh, the, there's too many people controlling all of, of, of the money. But in fact, it started off as um, a, a, an attempt to change legislation regarding who can you know, contribute money, including unions and other corporations, to campaigns? Is that the case? Yeah, yeah. If you go back to the original tactical briefing that we wrote at Adbusters. So what happened at Adbusters is we basically we wrote this tactical briefing and calling for the Occupy movement. And in that tactical briefing, we basically said, let's go down to the, to the financial districts and, and have these general assemblies and come up with our one demand, you know, the one demand that's really going to change the world. And, it, and we put forward the idea that it should be to get money out of politics. OK, and so let me stop you here. How many of you actually knew that? I see seven <laughs> hands in the audience. <laughs> so um, but the reason why I mention it is because, at, well, at the same time, Occupy, we, none of us, many of us didn't actually know what the initial impulse was. It did morph into this incredible conversation. And you mentioned this in your just previous comments about Nobody was talking about the 1%. Now that's almost a meme, you know? I mean, it's just, it, it, it's gone viral to a certain extent. But you, don't, you wouldn't consider raising consciousness enough, right? No, I think that's precisely the point. I think that when we, I think that seeing raising consciousness as a success lowers our horizon of possibility. Occupy Wall Street was a revolutionary social movement. It was born out of the Arab Spring that had toppled you know, dictators abroad. And our goal was to fundamentally transform society. So I think that one of the, one of the dangerous things that's happening right now is this, is this idea that, that social activism, the best you can possibly hope for is informing people or getting people to talk about an issue, which I would call social marketing, not social activism. <laughs> and I think that social activism is actually about um, transforming the world, having a revolutionary transformation of the way we live. And so I, just, I, I, I see this kind of argument that, well, you guys changed the discourse. That's symptomatic, though, of our own defeat. You know, because we're not able to point to something greater, we comfort ourselves with this lesser, lesser thing. In fact, you have three cardinal rules of activism, so and I, I'll share them with you. One is never broadcast in accurate news. The other is never conceal defeat. And the other is never exaggerate victory. And I think what you're saying is that in the case of, of Occupy, all of those things, in fact, happened. Is that the case? Right, yeah, and those three rules, those are from uh, Regis Debray. And so like, I think that partly the, reason, partly the reason why we broke those rules is because of social media. There's this, there's this tendency to want to you know, make ourselves feel good. I think that we, we, it's social marketing again. It's this idea that why don't I just throw up some like pretty pictures of the protest movement and start to, <laughs> and, and make myself feel better. But instead, I think that that, that that tendency is the reason why we aren't really kind of breaking through to the next level. You, in fact, have a, have a strategy. I don't know whether it's a strategy. I think you'd be happy if I used the term theory uh -huh. of activism in which um, a successful revolution can only 
exist if four paradigms are integrated together. So I'd like you to go through the four of them so that um, our audience can get a sense of exactly what we're talking about. So the first, so what we're talking about are four different approaches to, to, to um, change that have to be integrated in order for a movement to be successful. So we start with voluntarism, right? Right, right. So the, 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 you know, we start, we, we realize that revolution is the interaction between humans and, you know, let's say, and the world at large, okay? So there's, there's, there's basically, if you draw, if think of a grid, there's a few different ways it can interact. This ends, comes up with four options. On the left side of the grid, would be theories that place an emphasis on human agency, human action. And on the right side would be a, a theories that say revolutions don't actually involve human agency, there's something outside of human control. On the bottom would be theories that say revolution is, is a material or a natural process that involves physical forces in our world. And, and then the top you have things that say, no, revolution is some sort of supernatural, possibly spiritual, but in any case it's immaterial, it's not a material thing. So we're gonna start with the most common understanding of activism, which is voluntarism, in the bottom left-hand corner. And what that says is that revolution is an interaction between humans and the natural world. So if we wanna change things, then what we need to do is, we've all heard this phrase, direct action, right? We need to put our bodies on the line, we need to get out into the streets, we need to block the traffic, or go up and you know, stop the coal factories with our physical bodies. Because social change under that paradigm is the result of humans acting on the natural world. It's called voluntarism. Gotcha. Now right. we get to structuralism. Structuralism. There's another option, though, if you go to the bottom right-hand corner. And that's the idea that actually revolution is a material, natural phenomenon for sure, but doesn't involve humans at all. And this we kind of understand from like Marx and, the, and you know, historical materialism, the idea that we need, you know, there has to be a willing historical moment. There has to be an economic crisis. Um, and there's been really interesting studies. I think people should check out this idea that they've studied. They've found that actually if food prices pass a certain threshold, that, more than any other factor, predicts a revolution. Cauliflower. Yeah, right, exactly. No, really. No, that I'm, not, I'm serious. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And, they've, and, they, and, and if you go back in time and you look at the food prices, you'll see that um, the Arab Spring and Occupy coincided with record high food prices. And then as soon as those movements started to decline, that's when the, the food prices passed this threshold. And that now we live in a time of decreasing food prices. I mean, I know in Canada you guys are experiencing some, but overall, internationally, it's, it's lower than. So that's structuralism, the idea that social change happens, it doesn't involve humans at all, it's some sort of other process involving, you know. Does the digital revolution fit into that? In what way? Well, I mean, so, so well, I'm looking at, at, at um, events outside of human well, I mean, obviously, the digital revolution is pro propagated by humans, yeah. but it's something that kind of feeds itself. But no, that's not it. Well, I mean, I think under it, de it depends on. I mean, there's, I think there's different arguments about what kind of structural factors could be could be the you know. But I think in terms of like what kind of empirical studies have been done, food prices are like the primary one. I think you know, Marxist theory would probably just say general economic economic crisis. But we have seen that stock market crashes don't necessarily entail um, a revolutionary moment. So. We move on to subjectivism. Okay. Subjectivism. So if we go up into the, now the top left-hand quadrant, this would be the, the area, the theories that say, well, revolution is a, it's a, it's a human, it involves humans, but it doesn't involve the material world at all. And here we have ideas that are like, if you want to change the world, you have to change how you see the world. It, because our, the way we see the world, or the way we, our internal reality dictates external reality. So the best kind of activism here is some sort of like meditation, yoga, things that make us feel more positive about reality. This is the subjectivism. Um, target people's interior minds in order to change how they perceive reality. So is it, is it, it's not, it's about perception of reality. It's not like if I take care of myself, I can become a better activist? Right, no, it's just about, it's about like, it, it would be literally like, you know, this idea that, um, you know, the world seems so gray when you've been dumped, but then you fall in love and everything's like, oh, what are you talking about? I love life, you know? Okay. <laughs> everything's going great, you know? So. That was a good example. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then we get to the more challenging, the most from my point of view, and I'm sure that when, that, that, that this will surprise some people, and I, I want to make sure I'm pronouncing it right. Theurgy, is that right? Right, theurgism, theurgy. Theurgism, theurgy. Yeah. yeah. Okay, go. <laughs> So this is the area that, you know, the reason why I diagrammed it out is because if you do the diagram, you realize, oh, there's a whole fourth quadrant that no one talks about. And that's this idea of could revolution possibly be something that is both doesn't involve humans and is not material? What would that be? 
And so I talk about this idea of theurgism, the idea that revolution is some sort of divine intervention into our world. It's a process that involves supernatural forces that are not under the control of humans and are also not physical and material. And this is for Western activists, obviously, you cannot go to this territory. No. This is, you know, like, don't, don't well, go there. Well, no, because it, so <laughs> it sounds like God to me. Well, it is, theurgy means God work in Greek. So it literally, we're talking, we're talking about sorcery. We're talking about, like, um, we're talking about theories of, of social change, though, that were dominant in the past. There have been times in human history when people did, for example, before a battle or whatever, pray to the gods and think that, you know, you know, that that was the result of it. So, but I think that, you know, this, this, this type of theory of social change is really helpful to think about if you consider the case of the origins of Christianity, I mean, the victory of Christianity, really, because Christianity was a social movement that was persecuted for 300 years. It was like the only social ideology in Rome that was, that was outlawed. It was the only belief system. They had a pluralistic paganist society, but only Christianity was, was oppressed. And they were, they, Christians were thrown to the lions and killed um, in front of cheering audiences. So how could it possibly be that Christians conquered the world? How could it be that, we're, that so much of the world is now Christian? And the answer is because two people, St. Paul and then Constantine, had visions of Jesus Christ in their dreams, right? Well, I guess what might be problematic about that is that even though many of us are aware of the radical origins of Christianity, um, it's current manifestation is not the most progressive and over a thousand centuries has been problematic rather than something we would want to celebrate. Right, no, of course. But, I, but I'm not talking about its current manifestation. I'm talking about its path to victory, you know? But, but just, I mean, because I'm so, this Christianity thing really got me, I gotta tell you. <laughs> um, there, are, there are many who would argue regarding you know, Christianity, but because we know that, that Saul had the revelation and became Paul. Right. But we also know that the, the church could not have grown without basically direct action, which is to say to go out into the people who are alienated from, from kings and give them a piece of the cross and say this is a piece of the cross or a piece of the shroud or whatever. So there still had to be some kind of organization. That no, that's a it. really good point. And I think that's, that leads me to like the point, which is that you can't just pick one of these four options and then, and then like focus on that and say, like, no, like the, I think contemporary activism just basically wants to be voluntarist. They don't want to really think about the other ones. And if they do, maybe they'll consider subjectivism sometimes. But, but structuralism makes them really uncomfortable because it might mean that like, they're protesting for no reason or something like that. So what I'm saying, though, is that successful revolutions and successful social movements um, involve all four elements. So as activists, we need to uh, combine them to varying degrees. So let's, let's go through some of the current movements that I'm sure members of our audience are involved in or have been involved in the past that have the most potential possibly to integrate all of these four elements. Okay. <laughs> okay so obviously I want to start with environmentalism because I can see the potential for all of them to coalesce. Um, except for the fourth, the most challenging, and you are saying supernatural, so a natural disaster doesn't qualify, right? I'll give you an interesting example for the fourth one. Okay. Or should we, should we end with that? We'll end with that. No. No, start you're, with it. It's your, it <laughs> <laughs> no, okay. it's your show. You okay. do what you want. Okay, here's one, here's one, here's something to think about, and people can debate, maybe this is structuralism, maybe this is theurgism. Okay. But now, there's been this really weird study that a Russian cosmologist did that he said that sunspot activity predicts revolutions on Earth. So... What does that mean? Are you buying it? Let's see. I mean, <laughs> no, seriously. Come no, on. really. Yeah, that's 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 the truth. So he so he went back and he and he you know I don't know if you guys know this, but there's basically storms on the sun, and he's gone and he went back throughout human history and he and he and he found times in which elevated sunspots and he and he and he 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 believes it was in like you know early uh, 20th century he believes that that significantly indicated the revolutions. So sun the sunspot obviously is something that we can't cause on Earth. But some people worship the sun as God. That's why I call it a theurgistic example. Mm -hmm. So the sun is kind of a deity, and the sun's energy and activity is somehow creating revolutions. I'm not necessarily saying it's true, but I'm just saying that if it were, if it, what if it were true that, that revolutions like Occupy were coincided with sunspot activity? What would you do as an activist? Well, yes, you know? that's what I was going to say. Would, <laughs> we, would we have to look and, and, and kind of predict when these, when these 
events are going to take solar events are going to take place, or do we do they reflect what's going on, or do they influence what's going right. on? Right. I mean, this is something I think about now because we are entering a. I mean, if this theory is true, it's bad news for activism because we're entering a period of sustained low sunspot activity. <laughs> <laughs> Don't no negativity tonight. No negativity. Um, you have actually some, I think, really valuable uh, critiques to make of the current environment, in the environmentalist movement. And in particular, you have said that there have been some, you find problematic um, the catastrophic approach to what's happening. You have some certain fears about how, about the development of eco-fascism. You throw some words around that are very powerful. And I'd like you to share some of those views with our audience this evening. Yeah, you know, I think that there's a, I think that the main kind of thing I find troubling about contemporary environmentalism is that it's become so dominated by a technocratic or scientific worldview. Um, for example, almost all of environmental activism is, has been oriented around this idea that we need to some, you know, keep the temperature below a certain degree, raise, or more importantly, that, it, that we don't, that we need less than 350 parts per billion of carbon dioxide. All of these things are things that only scientists and technocratic people can can tell the people. We can't feel how much carbon dioxide is in, is in the air and stuff like this. Right. And I think that, that, that more importantly though, it, it kind of justifies a um, potentially negative approach in the sense that I think that, there's, that there will be people who can kind of, who start to see that actually because of the severity of climate change, the fact that it's a global existential crisis that affects the survival of us all, it's a tremendous political power that can come from being the one who promises to be the savior about, on that issue. And so I think that right now we see traditionally on the right or whatever, oh, they're gonna deny climate change. But I could, I could see it actually flipping right to the other side where they say instead, oh no, we're gonna save climate change, but it's gonna mean like no civil liberties for any of you because we need to like completely, you know, extend the scientific worldview to every aspect of our lives. And, and proscribe how we're living our lives as well, right? Right, right. and control how we're living our lives and, and all this kind of stuff. So I think that, yeah, for me, I think that the, the, the main thing about environmentalism is that it needs to find its soul again and realize that it, it doesn't need to be purely a scientific, scientific movement. And I think we also have to put our faith in a social movement. Only a social movement is going to be able to, to solve climate change. Only a global social movement will be able to um, gain sovereign control over the planet in order to break down barriers and borders and allow climate refugees and all this kind of more. So you've been clear that, you know, huge demonstrations protesting climate changes is, are, have been, they're, they're kind of useless. Yeah I, yeah, I do think they're useless. I think that they are not, they're not designed, let's put it, let's put it in clear terms. Large marches for climate change are not designed to overthrow or change the regime of any government on this earth. They're designed, they're social marketing. They're designed to publicize the presence of an issue in order to give the elected representatives a way to say, I'm responding to this constituent that's constituency that's in the streets. That's why I'm doing this thing. And is, well, why is that bad? I mean, we've seen, you know, we, we've, we've experienced a, 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 a time where the climate change deniers were winning, and now I think they're losing. Um, we don't know how it's going to shake down in our own country because uh, I'm not sure where the pipelines are going or any, anything <laughs> like that. But we, we have, like, I, I, I sometimes think that raising consciousness is, is kind of a good thing. I see that as happening with Occupy. Um, I, I definitely feel the environmental movement has, and we had the experience here with the with the plastic bags, it just has completely transformed. You know, people look at you with plastic bags now as if you're mm, not so good. Uh, so, I mean, that, I mean, are, are those kinds of things to you are not as mean, meaningful, or are they just the first step in something bigger? I think what I'm saying is that, that that's easy stuff. That's easy stuff to accomplish. And so if you set your sights at only doing that, that then, you then you miss out on the much larger and the more difficult and far more important challenges of gaining sovereignty for the people in order to actually institute the changes they want to see instead of demanding changes from their government and this kind of thing. So, I, so I'm not denying that activism is able to achieve those kind of things, you know, like the catch-up debate that you guys just had. Yes, mm -hmm. we successfully we got... We love our catch-up. <laughs> you know, we successfully we, got them. Canadian tomatoes <laughs> taste better than right, American exactly. tomatoes. You know, but you have it like, but, but and that's great and everything, but at the same time, like, let's be real, it hasn't like fundamentally changed the economic structures of Canada. No. Right, so, so what I'm saying is like, it's, it's, we can, those things are easy. 
You know, those things are easy, and we shouldn't just content ourselves with them. Um, maybe, maybe we should stop for a second and talk about what we mean by revolution, because yeah. I think that might help the conversation, which I'm enjoying, by the way, but this still might help the conversation. Um, you know, we, uh, I remember when they were demonstrating in Tahrir Square, and then Mubarak left, and I looked around at the now offices, and I said, like, we got to go out in the streets, man. Yeah. <laughs> this is like, I couldn't believe that you could have a demonstration yeah. and actually overturn a government. Now, of course, that didn't last long, and no good has, become, has come of it. But one of the things you say very pointedly is that we have to take over, the, uh, we or the people, the good guys, have to take over legislative and executive powers, yeah. which I, I think I, I was... I was kind of surprised when I read that, Micah, because it sounded almost like, and I know that you don't mean this, and I don't mean this as a judgment, a soft revolution, huh. that it's almost like working through the system. But that's not what you mean when you say we, we have to seize those powers. No, I don't mean, I mean, I don't, wouldn't it be great if it was soft, though? I mean, I don't think that we should somehow fetishize a hard revolution. Um, but but that's, not, that's, not what I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I think that... Like, if you take the example, I think that the example of Egypt is really, really important. So what happened in Egypt, it, it seems to me, is that they basically had these, these, youth, these secular youth who inspired, you know, a beautiful uprising, and they got the, all the people into the streets, and Mubarak stepped down due to international pressure because the international community was able to say, look, you have these people in the streets, you have to step down. So he steps down. But then the this, this secular youth made a major tactical mistake, strategic mistake, which is that they didn't then run for power. They didn't run for power. They stepped aside. The Muslim Brotherhood got into power. So I think what I'm, what I'm trying well, to- Well, there was a candidate from the from, El from Barida, the secular, yeah. yeah, but he just, I mean, he didn't, you know what I mean? He didn't have the base, the, you know, he didn't have that, that backing. Like the Muslim Brotherhood saw that this was- The, the vacuum. Muslim, yeah, they saw the vacuum, and moreover, they, they realized, oh my God, we were just like a literally an illegal organization moments ago, and now we're about to become the leaders of this. So they, they had no, you know, they had a real... So I think that the thing is that, that activism, that's kind of what parallels what happens, I think, in, in a lot of countries. In a lot of countries, we, we just think that our role somehow is to protest and make noise, but we don't think about the second part, which is we could actually protest as a means to becoming the government and gaining control of the government in order to actually carry out our desires. That's what a, that's what a revolution is. So revolution, like, it's very hard to define, but I think the definition that I, that I try to put forward that I think helps us give a broader horizon is a revolution is a change in legal regime. That's it. And so it can be, that's why some revolutions can be very small, like overturning a law, a specific law, it's kind of like a revolution. Or, but in the broadest sense, what it really is, is it's a struggle over who creates the laws. You know, it's a change in legal regime. And so the goal of, of activism is to become the power that, that sets the laws, that creates the laws. So I think it's useful to distinguish between a single issue protest. Because many of us in this audience have been, you know, every time uh, uh, Henry Morgenthaler's clinic was busted, we were out there in the street to try to make sure that women had access to reproductive freedom. Um, We've had an issue here uh, with police carting black people and a huge response and trying to develop change in that way. And sometimes in those situations, we've been successful. But you're looking at something bigger. Right. Um, and I was interested in your section of the book where you talk about the slow change versus the long, you know, mm. the, the short change. So I want to talk a little bit about feminism because I think it's a, it's, it's a really interesting example and, a, and another movement that could, I mean, possibly integrate all four of your paradigms except in terms of theurgy, in which case somebody like Gloria Steinem would have to be considered a goddess or something like that. <laughs> but but I, I don't mean to, to, to trivialize your, your point. But I, I mean, those of us who were involved in that movement have been, like somebody like me who's been involved for now 40 years, have, you know, it's so not over. <laughs> but we have seen unbelievable change. Um, when we started, nobody was talking about sexual assault, nobody, you know, and, and, and what was so wonderful about the movement is that we knew that we could approach change in almost every single level of our living, living lives that everywhere we looked, there was an issue we could take on. 
And in fact, you've said, you've, you, you see m much potential in women as, as, a, a, as a power. Yeah. And you know, we can see what's going on in India with sexual assault there. We can see um, uh, how women are, are almost beginning to change some of the economics in Africa. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about how you see feminism fitting in, or, or women's movement mm -hmm. fitting in, into your paradigms. Yeah, for sure. You know, the thing about revolution is it always comes as a surprise. And I think that people, it's very difficult to predict when it's going to happen. In fact, it's, just as an aside, it's kind of interesting to note that the Russian Revolution in 1917 started on International Women's Day. And that, in fact, at that time, everyone, the Bolsheviks included, they said, this isn't, the time isn't right for revolution um, or protest. In fact, they tried to, to ban protests on International Women's Day, but it was the women textile workers who went into the streets. And from that action, it spiraled into this, this whole revolutionary moment. So I think when I kind of like look into the future and try to get like, you know, what's my revolutionary instinct telling me about what could happen next? I think it's women, I think it's a women-led social movement. I think a women's social movement could emerge that eclipses Occupy Wall Street so fundamentally that, that one day we could wake up and just like we woke up when we saw people in, this, in, this, in the squares, you know, in their encampments, we could wake up and we could see women protesting of all ages and we don't understand where did they come from and what's going on, but suddenly it's spreading to 82 countries just like Occupy did. So I think that, you know, how would that happen? I think that the core thing to understand is that social movements are created by a contagious mood combined with a new tactic. Mm -hmm. So I can imagine some sort of contagious mood just like sweeping among women, you know, and then all of a sudden it's just like, yeah, I feel that too. And then it's like, and then there's some sort of new tactic. We don't know what it looks like, but something that surprises people and suddenly makes them believe like, wow, this is, this is it, this is gonna work. We're gonna get the feminism, that we're, gonna, we're gonna have that feminist revolution or, or matriarchal revolution or whatever like that we finally have ever wanted. So I see that as one of the kind of like beautiful scenarios that we could see in the years ahead. Hmm. Um, you made a point of saying that one of the big challenges of, of revolutions and activism is that the power and the powers that be have become more and more adept at uh, responding and co-opting and getting ready for us. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, protest has become part of the political spectacle. I think we all kind of know that in our hearts that we realize that these politicians are able to absorb a certain level of protest. You know, I think the best example of that, of course, is the 2003 um, anti-war march. It was, it, that happened in every single country, basically, all over the world. People went into the streets with a unified message of no war. This was to, to, to oppose the proposed war in Iraq. Yes, it was February 15, 2003, so about a month before the war started. Um, everyone went into the streets. It was beautiful, it was amazing. And if you Google images of that, you Google February 15, 2003, you'll see these amazing shots of like a million people in London all holding a sign that just says no to the war. Like it was very obvious what this was about. <laughs> And you know, and there, something really important happened that night is that after all the protesters went home, George Bush got on television and he said, I don't listen to these protests because if I listen to the protests, it's like listening to a focus group, but I base my politics on you know, what I believe, not focus groups. And so he just dismissed all of these global protests as a focus group. And I think ever since then, actually politicians have realized that actually we can just do that. These protests are just, you know, they're just like, they're just like people's opinions, but they're not, they don't matter, you know, that's how they treat them, you know? So I think that as activists, we've been, we've been chasing this paradigm of like, no, no, if we can just get more people into the streets rallying behind this thing, you know? And I think that's kind of a core insight is to realize that there's no, there's no reason or power that forces elected representatives to like, oh, what, you got 10,000 people in the streets? Oh, okay, like, I agree, you know? There's, that doesn't exist. <laughs> We want, we, no, we act as if it does exist. It sounds funny, but we do. We really act as if it does exist. Like, well, if a million people marched in New York City, then I guess the president would have to listen. But no, why? There's no law that says that. Nope. I see. I see. <laughs> I see your point. Um, <laughs> um, uh, let's talk a bit. Um, I, I mentioned it briefly about the long view versus the short view. Right. Because I know that a couple of years ago, I guess it, it might have been in the nine, I can't remember exactly when it was, but a bill to give same-sex benefits to gays and lesbians um, did not pass in our Ontario legislature, and I was really, really upset. Like, I, I, had, a, I had a real personal crisis, and a great old activist came up to me and, and, because I was doing a, 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 an event, and I had made this impassioned plea, and explained how upset I was. 
Um, as a lesbian mother, I was just freaked out. And he came to me and he said, do you know how long it took us to get Medicare in this country? It did not take us a week, and it didn't take us a month, and it didn't, you know, it didn't take us a year. We worked for decades to develop what I think we'll all agree is one of the great social policies of this country. You guys need one, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not your fault that we don't have one, so I'm not pointing at you. But anyway. So, um, and yet at the same time, sometimes we do see incremental change in short moments. But talk a little bit about the long view versus the short view. You have the 28 days thing. Yeah. I like that too. Yeah, so yeah. You can, if you can integrate some of that into your answer, I'd appreciate it. Right. So I think there's like, there's basically, there's two time scales of activism. There's the, there's the fast time and there's the slow time. So the fast time is that, is that amazing ability that we see of social movements to suddenly arise suddenly, go into the streets, all of a sudden, you know, within you know, 20 days or 28 days, they basically, like it took 28 days for Occupy to, to basically reach 50% of Americans that heard of the movement, which is a tremendous feat. 150 million people knowing about a word, I mean, a phrase, Occupy Wall Street, within 28 days. So we have this fast time perspective, which, which is enabled by the internet and, and social media. Um, but then we also, there's also this slow time perspective. There's this, there's this, the slow time perspective, it says things like, um, you know, like Thomas Jefferson, who said that, the generation that starts the revolution never li rarely lives to complete it. Or other people have said that all revolutions actually take three generations. Um, or if you think about it even on a larger scale, you realize that, that the people have been rising up against tyrants and against dictators and, and, and get, trying to get to a more egalitarian society since like ancient Egypt. Like we actually have papyrus from ancient Egypt that talks about revolution against the king. So from the long-term perspective, we are just kind of um, a blip in a much longer human journey, multi-generational journey that's 5,000 years old. But, at the, but on the other hand, we do, as activists, are trying to create social change within our own lifetimes. And so it's, it's, you have to balance the two against each other. I think that it's really important not to just kind of, there's a kind of quietism that can happen when you just say, well, revolutions take three generations, I'm probably the first generation, so there's probably two more, so I should just kind of like chill out a little chill, bit. Chill, right. You know? <laughs> but, but it's hard to say, like maybe we're the third generation. You always have to like kind of, I think, fight as if you are the third generation or something. But at the same time, you know, I think that what that activist said to you is correct. You know, we do have to have this kind of nuanced perspective about how time works. But on the fast side, I think the fast side is really crucial for activists to realize, which is that when planning a protest, I think a rough metric for how fast it has to be is that we shouldn't plan protests, fast protests, that last more than 28 days. 28 days is how long it took for the Arab Spring to topple Mubarak. It's how long it took Occupy to reach mass, con mass consciousness. And when we, when we try to go past that point, we inevitably start to lose. And there was this moment, I think, with Occupy Wall Street that was so telling, which is that in early November, things were really turning sour. The winter was coming. The police were sending all these drunks into the encampment in Zuccotti, really changing the mood. And at Adbusters, we sent out this tactical briefing saying like, hey guys, we should like, why don't we just declare victory and kind of wrap it up until the spring? But I would talk to people on the phone, these occupiers in New York, and they'd say, no, 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 we have so much money, we're gonna buy $40,000 winter tents, and we're gonna live in these winter tents in the, in, in the square. And I would say to them like, no, it's not that the winter is too cold, it's that it's too long, you know? They had no sense of the, of the of the fact that it's, it cannot last that long. And as we saw very soon, it was evicted. So for activists, I think we have to figure out how do we, how do, we do these kind of like fast events that achieve their objectives very quickly while also maintaining this long-term perspective that kind of ties it into a longer story. Hmm. So when you look out into the world, and uh, I know that you're frustrated with the way activism has unfolded, um, that it's not taking into account all of the elements required for a successful revolution. But are you feeling hopeful at all? What gives you hope? Is, or yeah. are you... Uh... No, absolutely hopeful. No, I, think it's, I do think it's really important that people realize that revolutions always happen when they seem least likely. And so... Um, and when there's a sunspot. And when there's a sunspot. Sun I don't know. You, gotta <laughs> ch you check that one out. I mean, that's interesting stuff. But, but it is true that, you know, like... The Russian Revolution in 1917 started at a time when no one expected it. Occupy started at a time when no one expected it. I know that because I was editor at Adbusters and we solicited people asking them, can a revolution happen in America? And they all said no, and then of course Occupy happened. So, so y there's no use getting uh, demoralized at all because 
it's almost as if like it needs to seem impossible before it can happen. So it's almost like when you're losing, you're about to win. So you might as well just be really happy at all times, you know. So, <laughs> you know, I think I, I think that we are still within that kind of revolutionary shadow that inspired Occupy Wall Street. I think we're still within that that time in which people are desperate for social change. And our challenge right now is merely to innovate activism. It's merely to develop new forms of protest, new ways of inspiring people. And then I think we'll see social movements that eclipse Occupy Wall Street. But we, we do stand at a kind of choice. We can kind of stay here, celebrate ourselves, tell ourselves that Occupy was this great success, that Black Lives Matter is doing this amazing thing, and all this kind of stuff. Or we can start to say like, okay, how do we get serious about this? How do we really do this, you know? But um, yeah, I have a feeling that when I look at the world, the international community, international protests, I think we're gonna see some amazing stuff happen. I mean, even in Brazil right now, there's a million people in the streets. Um, it's not unlikely that they could innovate some sort of new tactic that, that, that does topple that government. And then we might see a kind of, you know, Brazilian spring that, that inspires a kind of wave this direction, you know? It's, it's interesting you mentioned Brazil because you did, you did comment that part of the problem with the situation in Egypt was that the government was toppled, but there was nothing to right. come in afterwards. And, 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 and when you were mentioning about seizing legal and, and executive control, I mean, I think that's, that's the big question. I mean, in, in, I guess in, in Russia, they take over the Kremlin and I don't know, it's done, but I, I, I guess that's what... I think that's what baffles activists, and that's is because you're right. The, the protest is the easy thing. Here I am. Here's what I care about. Listen to my voice. Yeah. And finding that that's that way to innovate to to actually figure out what the next level is seems to be the biggest challenge. Don't you Absolutely. Think? Yeah. I mean, I think that the Brazil thing is really telling because they they had a social movement in 2013 that was very much like Occupy. It started around a fair hike. It spiraled into a massive social movement, and then it dissipated just like Occupy did. And now they're getting a second chance. It's 2016. It's you know early in the year, just like Arab Spring started early in the year. But they also, you know, they still have to solve that problem of like, how do we not just topple the government, but how do we? And I think how do we run the government? I think a lot of activists are afraid of that question. I think that we don't we don't want to. Um, you know, there's something weird. If you read the history of the Russian Revolution, the same thing happened. It's like the people wanted to protest, and then as soon as the the czar was overthrown, they're like. Okay, let's give the government to the bourgeoisie now, you know, and and, and that's what the Bolsheviks had to fight against. They're like, no, no, stop trying to give the, the give the power away. I think we kind of like, which is what the secular youth did in, in Egypt too. It's like it's like we're scared to hold the power, you know, because it's so much easier to be the complaining side that's throwing temper tantrums in the streets. Um, mm -hmm. But we have to we have to combine the the ability to to overthrow governments with the ability to to be a good government, and you know, so it's it's really a challenge. So are you feeling how, are you hopeful versus challenged versus, but you're not depressed, obviously. Because, you know, <laughs> no, you're, I, you're feeling hopeful. I feel hopeful. I mean, I, I will never forget that. You have to remember the experience of, like, of Occupy and how it came out of nowhere. And I just, it could happen any time. It could happen any, any time. We could wake up tomorrow and Brazil could be toppled and all of a sudden people are inspired. We could wake up tomorrow, there could be women in the streets. Like, that's the nature of social movements is that they bubble up spo seemingly spontaneous, but right now there could be a group of activists who are really planning something beautiful. And I think that that's one of the reasons I wrote my book is to kind of like in increase the sophistication of how we think about activism. Um, so yeah, I think there's no use being, <laughs> being demoralized at all. It's not, the end of protest is not a permanent state. It's just one of those phases within the cycle of social change that we have to break out of. I mean, we could, we could be here a long time for sure, but I, I remain optimistic instead that activists are more innovative than we ever been, have been before, and that somehow, because of the power of the internet and our ability to move tactics around the world very quickly, you know, within 24 hours we could, if something did come out of Brazil or China, it could be in Canada within 24 hours, and all of a sudden it's just a beautiful time again. It could happen in this room for all yeah, you know. Yeah, it could. Um, I'm opening up the floor to questions, so uh, are, the there, where, are there microphones or no? Yeah. Right here to line up. There's right a microphone. So if you would come to the microphone and ask your questions, um, I uh, please uh, you can make statements. I don't mind statements <laughs> before you ask your question, but please don't go on for a long time, or I will. I'm sorry to say, cut you off. So 
First okay. question, please. Okay, watching the rise of Trump is turning me against democracy, but <laughs> would you consider the Trump phenomena to be a revolution? Because it fits all your criteria, and I'm pretty sure his supporters think of themselves as activists. Mm. Yeah, okay, so this, this I'm, thank you for asking that question, it's really good. I think the thing that's really kind of important to admit right now is that protest is, it's like a, it's a form of war, okay? And, and protest, it's, it's almost like a weapon. And, and it's not something that is exclusively under the domain of the left, although we would wish that it were. Social movements, no, there's many forces of, in this world. And people have seen that social movements have this tremendous capacity to, to, to spontaneously arise and, and you know, do things. And so we have different, different sides of the political spectrum are now vying to be the best at mastering protest and social movement creation. And so that's just like a realistic understanding. I think that the left has been complacent to a certain degree. I think that when I see Trump, what I see happening is that he is stealing the thunder of what Bernie Sanders should have done. I think that Trump's, by Trump saying that he's going to have riots in the streets and protests if he doesn't get the vote, is exactly what Bernie Sanders should have said like weeks ago. Bernie Sanders should have said, I'm no longer in this Democratic primary. It's obviously a scam. Hey, occupiers that are supporting me, let's have street protests and swing this election. Please join me on the anniversary of Occupy Wall Street. Boom, it would have been over. But instead, he is like this squishy progressive left that we have in America. Let me remind you again that Occupy Wall Street did not come from America, it came from Canada, okay? The progressive left in America is, it's risk averse. It's afraid of actually, it uses the rhetoric of revolution without actually calling for a revolution. So now we have the only point person who will do it is on the right. And now Bernie Sanders can't possibly call for street protests around the election because Bernie, because Trump has done it, you know? So I, I just blame the left in, in, in America and it's kind of like, it's progressive play at safeness, you know? That's, it's, we have no one to blame but ourselves and I, and I firmly do not believe that Trump will be elected. I also don't believe that Trump has the, I think the left has, is, still has the dominant ability to mobilize the grassroots, but maybe Trump will figure it out, you know? I think it's a wake-up call. It's a wake-up call that the left, if you want to use the language of revolution, Bernie Sanders, then act like a revolutionary and otherwise suffer the consequences. So this is what's going on there. Yeah. Next question, please. Yeah. That's a good so um, I'd like You know, going back to Brazil, and you think about the 1.5 million people that are in the streets, not just one city, but many cities. Yeah. Um, but the infrastructure that lays below that um, doesn't give the opportunity to give very much force in any one direction for revolution, because they have uh, the Zeta um, health concern that's going on there, they have the Olympics that are coming this summer, and they have an economy that they're trying to transfigure into brick, right? Mm. So they're into a substantial global network that when you rise up into the street, there's very limited. Uh, you go to Hong Kong, the same protests that were on, what, a year and a half ago. It was about the fact that China was saying who could get into the electoral race. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Hong Kong wants to preserve its latitude because of its British heritage. Yeah. But China wants to market that, and there's huge corruption levels that are going off. So it seems to me that revolution tends to be topical. What my mm. need is, or my collective need, mm. the people that associate with me, once that's achieved, then we go on to this long progress, as you were speaking, mm. about the next need that emerges. And we can, the human can endure very, very many things. Mm. One thing that I didn't hear in your talk, and this is what I'm going to give you the open opportunity to speak about, is the localization, the fact that maybe that's where community building, the type of society that you're after, goes into a more localized environment. And in fact, you talk in your book about your, the community exactly. you live in now. Exactly. So right. maybe yeah. that's a, thank you for your question. And perhaps <laughs> yeah. I just yeah, yeah, wanted yeah. to mention that this is in the book. No, um, it's true, it's true, it's true. Yeah, this is, so another one of the revolutionary scenarios I kind of imagine is this question of rural revolts, like after Occupy Wall Street, my wife and I moved from where we were living in Berkeley, California. We, now we live in a tiny town of 280 people on the Oregon coast. It's a rural community, um, and it's, it's kind of fundamentally changed my understanding of activism, because if you think about 99% of all activism is, is all the tactics are urban. You know, blocking streets, for example, makes absolutely no sense where I live, <laughs> where everyone's like your neighbor, and there are no big corporations, there's no stoplights, and the whole city is like four square blocks. So, it doesn't make any sense. So 
you have to think, you, it forces you to get creative and to think other options. And I think when we talk about taking control and governance, it seems very difficult to imagine on a large scale, but it is true that it's, it's actually quite easy at the small scale. We have an election coming up in our tiny town of 280 people for city council, mm -hmm. and there's three seats up for, up for vote because of uh, divine intervention, actually. <laughs> One, no, I'm not kidding you. They, they structure the elections in my town so that, the, so that two seats out of five are up for election at any given time. You can never win a majority, right? But this election, aha, uh -huh, the mayor died. That leaving an extra seat up, so two. But then one of the city councilors moved out of town. Three seats are available for the first time. So a social movement could quickly win all votes and control my tiny town. <laughs> it's divine intervention. So that's the kind of local thing. Yeah, sure. Well, unfortunately, this goes into Oregon history, but there was a cult that moved into Oregon once and tried to do this very thing. So now they pass a law, they have to live there for one full year before, before you, can, you can do it. Right? So, they, so they've got this. You gotta be in there for the long term. But um, One year's not that long. It's not, it's not that long. <laughs> if you think strategically, yeah. But I do wanna say something about the first, the first thing, you know, about Brazil. One of the reasons why Brazil is really interesting, though, is that they have like the astronomical social media use and so I think that is part of what powers these kind of, they, these social movements that suddenly arise is that, I don't know why it is, people don't know, but a lot of tech companies study Brazilian internet use because they are like even more internet engaged than Americans. It's, it's really weird. They use social networks really intensely. Um, I just know six years in China. And right. It's been there. Yeah, it's really, yeah. Okay, thank you for your question, yeah. Next question. Yes, I was just going to thank you for sharing your enthusiasm for, uh, the equivalent of ramen noodles uh, in, in terms of social change within, you know, major social change within 28 days. Uh, you know, that's certainly ambitious and reflects, I say, your youthful enthusiasm. Uh, but some of us with a longer view of history uh, go back to and think about the dynamic, underlying dynamic in such events as the French Revolution, which of course started off on a, a marvelously egalitarian uh, direction and ended up in a dictatorship. Yeah. So I just wonder, in your scheme of things, do you allow for that kind of dialectic uh, transformation? And of course, just going back to the initial question, here in Toronto, we too had a major protest movement that led not to enlightenment, but to uh, the reign of error under uh, Mayor Ford. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, this is this is again. This is so important. I think this. What you. I think what you just said is so indicative of the situation that the left finds it in. The left right now largely doesn't believe in the possibility or desirability of revolution. I think this is absolutely fascinating. We have become disgruntled about the very thing that we created. We created the concept of universal revolutions that would somehow improve the livelihood of everyone involved. And then after the experience of the French Revolution, the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, all this kind of revolutions up until the 20th century, it's like we gave up on it. And so now in the 21st century, we're like, we get questions like you're saying, and I'm not disagreeing with you, I'm actually saying that that is symptomatic of where we find ourselves. I, I'm tell, I, I guess what I'm saying is that we need to regain that optimism about the desirability of revolution again. I think that you're absolutely right that revolution is a messy, dirty thing that has resulted in injustice. I mean, I'll give you an example that always shocked me about the French Revolution. You know what they did during the French Revolution? Is they would just take people who had been accused of being like counter-revolutionaries, they would put them on a barge, like thousands of people, and then just drown them all. That was their version of justice. Okay, it's disgusting, it's horrible, I agree with you. But it shouldn't allow us to lose sight of the larger thing, which is that the French Revolution also brought us concepts of brotherhood and fraternity and democracy and all of these kind of things. So revolution is one of the ways that society makes its great leaps forward. We need them. It's part of the progress, progress of human civilization. And I think that it's really important that the left stops giving up on revolution because otherwise we just have these, the right that believes in revolution and Islamic fanatics that believe in revolution, which is what we see with ISIS. ISIS being the only kind of social movement that thinks it can like take over and govern and, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So I think it's just, I'm not disagreeing with your prognosis about past revolutions, but I am disagreeing with about your pessimism about future revolutions. I, I would just add, there's much to be said for the uh, Canadian, uh, long, or long Canadian tradition of incrementalism, I think, uh, as someone who perhaps used to hold views closer to yours, but now has moved into uh, you know, a more sort of a mellower old age, <laughs> I, I find small change to be more tolerable. Mm. No, okay, and I, I think that's a really good thing because 
it is important that we acknowledge that change makes us uncomfortable. Change is not a pleasant feeling. New ideas are not pleasant. In fact, there's been studies about creativity where people will they'll verbally celebrate creativity, but if you study their emotions about creativity, they actually associate it with like poop and negative and vomit. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. This is real. This is real. People have like in their in their in their in their subconscious, we associate creativity with very disgusting and uncomfortable things, even though we celebrate it verbally. So I agree with you, change is uncomfortable, change does not feel good, change is unpleasant, but this is something that we have to acknowledge, you know, instead of running from it. Next question, please. Uh, good evening, my name is Lee. Thank you very much for a most interesting discussion. Thank you. I was born an American, so I'm, I'm quite uh, aware of the American fascination with revolution and, and the belief that it is actually a way to change the world positively. Um, but I share the previous questioner's skepticism. I'm now a Canadian, a proud Canadian, been here for decades, uh, most of my life, actually. And it seems to me that if we look at the historical precedents, the ones that happened in our lifetime, in 1980, Mrs. Thatcher and Ronald Reagan got elected. By 2010, the US Supreme Court authorized the buying of politicians by corporations. Well, this is what this, Occupy was about. This, right? Yes, but where did it get? My point is, Mrs. Thatcher and Ronald Reagan put together a, a revolution which was creeping environmentalism. They basically bought the nation, and now they're buying the world. Unless you address the, the means for this revolution. Revolution, in most people's mind, means violence. Uh -huh, yeah, okay. Women don't do violence. Women do not do physical violence. Maybe that's why they should be in charge of the revolution then. <laughs> <laughs> I very much, I totally agree, I totally agree with you. That's, when I write books, that's what I write about. Yeah. But how are you, how are you gonna have, the, the, the Egyptian model you're suggesting failed because, and Janice Stein here told us in the very beginning, it will fail because the army is in charge. Uh, Unless you deal with the army, you uh, will never change Egypt. She uh, was totally right. She knew that from day one. It had nothing to do with the, the circus that was going on in the streets. No, no, so I'm suggesting if the revolution is going to be a revolution, I don't agree with it. I think it should be creeping incrementalism <laughs> on the Canadian model that buys back our country and our world. That's what we need. Okay, mm. thank right. you. Yeah, thank yeah. You. Okay. I mean, but I do want to key in on to what you're saying about the military. I think it's absolutely true. I think that... The military, it is this force that um, ultimately hides behind or stands behind democracies and that they're the ultimate, I think, um, problem for sure, for sure. But there, Violet, and, but, and police too, and to the extent that when police decide they're not going to do to the demonstrators what they're being told to do to the demonstrators, something changes, right? I think, yeah, I think what I'm trying to say about, I agree with you, and I'm, I think what I'm trying to say about the military, though, is that it's, it's, in our governments, it still remains the ultimate sovereignty, sovereign power. So if you were to topple the elected representatives of our country and try to replace them, like we saw in Egypt, the, the, and, and this happens all the time, you know, like the, gov the military still kind of is this force that is somehow hovers above that and gets to be like, no, we don't like that change, and it can kind of step in. Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the things they did with the Russian Revolution is they figured out how to basically, they took over the military and then used that as part of the revolution. So, and this is, you know, so it is really, you know, if we want to get sophisticated in our thinking about revolution, there is this big elephant in the room, which is the military. I mean, how can you even conceive of, of revolution in America with, with the, their military, this is why Trump, I think, ultimately will not win, and I don't know what will happen to him, but he is not solving the military question. The military is not like Trump, as far as I know. Well, yeah. I, of course, in our country, the military doesn't, you know, we, we bring them in to shovel the snow every once in a while. You know? <laughs> yeah. So, but. I mean, it has definitely uh, expanded its reach under Harper, and uh, I don't want to minimize that, but we don't have the same relation to the, right. to the military here as, as, as in other countries. So, without, can, I'm without, sorry, sir, can okay. we move on to the next questioner? Thank you for your question. Thanks. Uh, yeah. Hi. Um, okay, so in Toronto right now, we have a really a puzzling ad campaign that's come to us from healthcare practitioners or doctors. And if you are at all around the University um, University of Toronto and the hospitals on uh, University Avenue in college, you'll see this um, bus shelter large advertisement with 
um, you know, um, they always seem to be white, middle-aged women saying, I am not an activist. I saw one of these, yeah. And I, I'm offended by these ads, but I, and maybe you've in some ways answered kind of what I think you might think of them in terms of the leftists, uh, the current trends to be uncomfortable with the idea of activism. So I'm wondering for your thoughts on their strategic campaign. By the way, it's also on the radio. Mm. And uh, where you think where you think they're going with that? Because I mean, I don't identify with it at all. But I mean, mm. maybe I'm not their target. I, I wonder if it would be useful to. Uh, am I right that that's the campaign to support the doctors? Believe it or not. Okay. Yeah. It's, Say no more. It's, yeah. <laughs> but but it's don't important so that it's cuts. it's just so every. I want to make sure that you're. Aware but I don't understand that. why is she not an activist. I saw well, that that, exactly. I think that's what the questioner is bringing up. Is that that the thing is? Yeah. Listen to me, I'm not one of those dirty, filthy activists, oh. and so, and I'm with the doctors who yeah. should get more money. I oh, think that's oh, the yeah. idea. Oh, oh, oh. Is, is that? Oh, okay. So the doctors are asking, because we have, as you know, a socialized right. healthcare service, they right. want more money, there's right. resistance to it. Right. The doctors are mounting a campaign for more money, right. and this campaign is emblem, uh, the, the woman in the, in the white, middle right. class probably, but certainly older woman, yeah. is emblematic of the, I'm supporting the doctors, and don't worry about me, I'm not an activist. Yeah, I mean, I did, I did see that poster. I thought it was fascinating and weird and interesting. And I think, like, I don't, <laughs> I would almost want to, I think the way, I, I don't know if I can really respond to your question other than to say that, you know, it totally piqued my interest. And the, I think the way that I go about my activism is I find examples like that. And then I either think about how could I detour in that, or how could I apply that to a new domain, and what, I think there is something really interesting and weird there, and so instead of like running from it or, or whatever, I would, I would try to figure out how could I, uh, you know, culture jam this, this weird, I am not an activist stuff. Who else could be behind that image with the words, I am not an activist? But, but plainly, that some ad agency did some focus group work and figured out that this is a way to advance the, the agenda. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, there's, I think that it, it does, I think, tie into this thing about how, you know, revolution, do we really want it? Is it desirable? Should we, is activism even good? And this kind of stuff. And our, don't we just get the social change we want if we just are patient enough and this kind of thing? Um, but, you know, the thing is that, is that Occupy made activism cool again, and we are in a time when it's, that's receding. You know? And I think that you have to remember that in 2010, it wasn't cool to be an activist. It wasn't cool in 2009, 2008. It really wasn't cool in 2007. You know? So this is just part of the, like, the ups and the downs. And pretty soon, you know, it'll be again like, oh, I have an activist. It's so cool. But, mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I don't have. I, I think that. Thank you for pointing that out. I'm gonna. I'm gonna research that and think about that because it really did kind of. It hit me. It was weird. Right? Yeah, for sure. It was weird. Next question, please. Um, so you kind of talk about. Uh, you're talking about Occupy. I think Occupy, one of its greatest legacies, is this form of decentralized organizing, which mm. you see in Black Lives Matter. Um, and funny enough, that sort of coincides with like blockchain technology. Um, how do you see then, because, you know, this kind of organizing is, you know, relies on sort of these smaller pods of action, they're coordinated, um, but you talk about how your hope is around, you know, pro a revolution in terms of the change of a legal regime mm. and, you know, using protest as a means to gain control of government. Government is a centralized entity, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering, like, how do you see that form formation and that kind of action right. actually affect change in something that's like this large entity. Right, in a sense. right. No, I think that's a really, really good question. So when I talk about how social movements need to win elections, I think what, I, I think what, I'm, what I'm trying to get across is this idea that we need to create some sort of hybrid form between social movements and political parties. So they wouldn't fully look like a social movement, but they also wouldn't fully look like a political party. I don't think that we should give up on the hope of the horizontalism or the leaderlessness. You know, obviously it had, it had some of its flaws, but at the same time, we can't return to the old model of leaders. This is one of the reasons that I reject Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump. I think that's, it's, a, it's a return to this idea of putting your hope in the leaders. So to answer your question specifically, though, about like, how would that happen? I think that is really the fundamental challenge that we're trying to figure out. And if you want to see, if you want to basically get a, a preview of how it could look, you know, you have to look at Europe. I think it's, it's really important to, to, to remember that 
the Spanish people in their movement in 2011, they went into the squares around their election time and they said, you don't represent us, we're not gonna vote, and then the right wing got into power. So now, flat, you know, go forward to 2016, 2015, what have they done? They have launched a social movement that is winning elections, it's called Podemos, it's called We Can. And so their model, I think that, so that we have, to, so basically what I would say is we have to look to Europe. Europe is, is actively addressing and trying to solve the very thing that you're talking about. They have Podemos in Spain, which is a social movement that's winning political power, but also its founder um, you know, got elected. And, but then you have on the other side, the Five Star Movement in Italy. A lot of the left doesn't like the Five Star Movement because, because they're typically associated with the right, even though they're not really right, whatever. I met with these guys, I thought they are fascinating. And, um, and what I like about them is that their, their creators, their leaders, don't run for office, okay? What they do is they've developed a model where the members of the Five Star Movement they, they nominate themselves to, to run for office and then other people within the movement vote for them based on like their YouTube videos and their, and their CVs. And, and it's actually created a, a movement that they're like full of like doctors and you know, like professionals and people who are willing to say like, here's who I am, let me talk to you openly and, and people vote for them. because they're like, yeah, that, that guy, he's, or that woman, you know? And it's worked, they have gotten into parliament. They've won European parliament seats and all this kind of stuff. And they're able, and they have, and they develop their own software to make com complex decisions and this kind of thing. So, so you have Podemos on one end, you have Five Star Movement, and then you have this new thing called Diem, which is kind of a, it's 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 being created by people who's like kind of splintered off of Syriza in Greece, and their goal is to win elections in multiple countries in Europe. So, I guess what I'm trying to say is, is that you know, just like Occupy Wall Street came from abroad, the next kind of iteration, we really to, to solve this question, we need to like look abroad and then. And then not just copy them, but also kind of give it our own, you know, Canadian or American twist. But, but you're, at, you're absolutely fundamentally right that the challenge right now is how, how would a social movement govern? How would a social movement do tasks typically only associated with leaders? How do you prevent the rise of leaders? Yet at the same time, how do you not like set into the paralysis that happened with Occupy where we couldn't even decide on anything? You know, we couldn't even <laughs> decide on like, that guy's obviously a Fed disrupting this meeting. Can we ask him to leave? You know, he couldn't even like, nothing was, nothing was able to get moved. So, but I, I, just, I just have this optimism that I, I think that in Europe they are figuring it out. I mean, just even that, that they can win elections at all is just amazing, you know? So it'll come, it'll come here. We'll figure it out. Yeah. I'm really sorry to say that we have time for just one more question. Um, I'm really sorry. I know you guys are waiting. Uh, where's my, uh, if your question is short, maybe two, but I, I'm uh, it'll be It'll be short. Two, you're in. So, <laughs> so you, sir, and then the person behind you. Okay. And, then, and I'm sorry, but of course, um, Micah is, is around. He's going to sign books. You can get FaceTime yeah. with him. You can even have a personal conversation with him. Yeah. But uh, we have time for two more. Go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I haven't ever had a chance to f fully read through your book, just having skimmed it over the last hour or so. <laughs> uh, but there, it, it seems to me to be a shortage of economic ideas in mm. it, uh, uh, which may be fine because maybe you have uh, economic ideas that you haven't uh, exposed here and have elsewhere. But uh, you're obviously critical of the money system, of the corporate system, of, uh, you mentioned capitalism a couple of times, of markets. But what is the economic structure mm. that this revolution that you're calling for would uh, adopt, impose, uh, operate under? I mean, that is a obviously extreme, extremely good question, you know. Um, I think that for me, you know, my passion with this book was to provide a kind of theoretical understanding of activism. I wanted to do like basically activism against activism. And so I didn't, I don't, I don't want to outline what my theory of the economic management of the future world government will be. You know, like I don't, I won't want to do that because I think that we actually, that, that movements actually orient around moods rather than specific policy issues and this kind of thing. So I guess what I would say to you is, you know, I think that it's not, it's not my expertise and it's not my passion, you know? So I, I, I know I, you, want, you want that, but I think I'm not giving it to you. I'm not gonna, <laughs> give it to you. I'm not gonna claim that I'm gonna give that to you, you know? I don't, I, how, how often do you hear a, a, an author in front of 500 people say, I don't know, I applaud you, really. No, seriously. <laughs> I don't, I, I mean, They're I, the scariest <laughs> words for people to hear, I don't know. You don't have to know everything, my God. I think yeah. that's okay. I think it's just, it's so complicated and it's, it's something that, 
It just, it, 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 it distract. I don't know. I don't know. I'll work, I'll work with it. Yeah. My next book, my next book. We'll work on that one. Okay. Last question, sir. You're in. Um, hi. So I guess, first of all, one of the comments from one of the gentlemen earlier about women not doing violence, I used to be homeless for a prolonged period of time. I met quite a number of women who are quite prepared to utilize violence. So I just <laughs> wanted to, uh, to point that out. Uh, secondly, my, uh, my upstairs neighbor is from Iran originally. And uh, he says, uh, in his opinion, he's very left-minded. He says he feels Donald Trump being elected would not necessarily be an entirely bad thing in the sense that it would provoke uh, really just a sort of open revolt in that sense because uh, people would really feel that their hand had been forced. Yeah. And uh, I have mixed feelings about that because I'm not an advocate for violence in any sense. But at the same time, the, uh, the system that we have is very entrenched in money and uh, in sort of misdirection and so on and so forth. I'm not sure that a uh, democracy in which the nominees are decided by the highest corporate bidders is really a democracy. And um, I mean, eventually, uh, you exhaust other options. <laughs> right, so. okay. So this is, I think, a really, it's a really important question and it's a good place to kind of like end because, you know, there, I totally reject what your neighbor is saying. I think that you can find people throughout history making that exact same argument. In fact, the German communists said the same thing about Hitler. Okay, we know exactly how that turned out. When Hitler got into power, there, no, there was no revolution against Hitler. I mean, come on. So this is a kind of defeatist position that activists get into, which is like, the masses aren't following me. Well, I'll show them something. Once they get that bad guy over there, they're gonna love me. And it's like, no, that's not how it works. People aren't motivated out of fear. So once the once the once the a fearful person gets into power, it actually destroys the movement, not in, not enlivens the movement. Social movements are created when people lose their fear, not not become more afraid. And so I think from a strategic perspective, it's really really a negative kind of um, mood that people get into. And I understand why they do it because it's kind of um, defeatist. But the reason why the re I'll tell you the reason why people are rallying not around the ideas of the left or whatever right now, or they're rallying around the, the, Trump, it comes down to this fundamental thing, which I'll say that Hitler said. Now Hitler, horrible person, but here is something that he said that was very perceptive. He said that the people don't vote for the strongest horse, they vote for the horse they believe is going to win. And social movements and the left have constantly tried to be the strongest horse with the biggest protests, but instead what people crave is the, is the force they think is actually gonna win. And so, what we need to do is, is, is start to convince people that if they join our movements, it'll fundamentally improve their lives and that we will win. That's what happened during Occupy. People believed that that, this, that was gonna work and they believed in the Arab Spring. Right now, people don't believe the left, okay? That's the truth. And why should they? But they're starting to believe Trump and that's the danger, okay? So we have to create movements that make people believe again and that involves new tactics, new moods, and this, you know, and, and inspiration, so. And you will get a lot of it from Michael White's book, which after this, the end of protest, which after this event is available in the back, and you can read it and talk to it. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for coming, and thank, thank you, you, Michael White. Thank you.